The SPY is a groundbreaking development in artificial intelligence, comparable to the advent of Lang Shen's idea of chaining large language model calls. Thinking about LLM APIs, they are exciting. They can be integrated into apps or used to create complex programs where the output of one language model call can be fed as input to the next. We can simplify complicated tasks, such as writing pull requests or blog posts, by breaking them down into research, writing and editing tasks. By parallelizing these tasks, we can take advantage of various control mechanisms. The SPI introduces a new syntax similar to PyTorch, which gives us more control and flexibility over our LLM programs. The exciting thing about the SPI is that it combines a new syntax with optimization. This means that we have optimizing instructions for tasks in our LLM prompts. For example, suppose your task is to re-rank documents and you have a re-ranking agent. In that case, a particular phrasing results in better performance than others. Also, if you need to output JSON, we will find ways to make it more efficient. Instead of saying, please output JSON or give me JSON, just use the optimized phrasing to get the best results. The idea behind the SPI is to optimize the instructions and examples used in the prompt automatically. This is done to elicit the desired kind of behavior when using the, the SPI program model. Many exciting things can be achieved through this process. The DSPI program model is where the story begins. It can be described as a combination of uh, PyTorch agent syntax and LLM programs. Let's dive in and explore what the process entails. To begin with, we initialize the components required for our LLM program. We start with a retrieval system, such as Quadrant, and connect it with a query generator and an answering mechanism. We have two distinct LLM components, or prompts, that carry out specific tasks. These could be fine-tuned models that are specialized for their roles in the overall LLM program, which we will refer to as the logic in the forward pass. Our first component is the query generator, and there are a few things to keep in mind about it. To begin with, we need to give the component a name, which we will call GenQuery. Next, we have the dspy.chainofthought, which we will discuss later. Let's start by talking about the signature. As we continue with this lecture, we will see that there is an alternative way of expanding the signature by writing a longer initial prompt in the doc string, and then adding a typed input output field. A feature in the SPI allows you to improve the appearance of LLM program codes by using signature syntax. The short syntax involves defining the context question and query fields. When you input the context and question, the SPI will parse it and output the query. The LLMs or large language models have an impressive ability to deduce the meaning of a variable just from its name. For instance, in a context question, powerful models like GPT-4 or Gemini Ultra can accurately understand the context from the name alone. Therefore, the second component of our program involves another LLM that generates the answer. This program takes the context and question as input and returns the answer. The exciting part is that you have the power to build LLM agents and define how they interact with the input data to produce an output. To start, we define an empty list scaled context. This also enables thinking about how we can incorporate local memory into our forward pass and how we can use non-parametric functions in the forward pass of our program. We start with an empty list of contexts and loop through it. 
which can be set as a hyperparameter in the program to determine how many hops are required. Multi-hop question answer involves breaking down a complex question into smaller sub-questions to effectively answer it. This approach is like the concept behind AutoGPT, which gained public attention when it was first introduced. The agent can evaluate each sub-question to determine if enough information has been compiled to consolidate the results. This process is referred as to multi-hop question decomposition. Our focus shall be on the DSPI program model. To generate a query, we take the context and the input question as input. This process helps us create the query. After generate the query, we pass it through our retriever quadrant. The retriever then provides us with the required context. We keep looping through the process until we have all the context we need to answer the question. The number of loops depends on the context. After generating a response, we can call it by inputting it into the conversation. The release of ChatGPT amazed everyone with its ability to fluently converse, answer questions, and create a YouTube script inspired by a favorite book or chat. We discovered we could take these large language models like ChatGPT even further by connecting them in chains to create more complex language models. Langchain and Drama Index work has been evangelizing a new way of building applications using large language models, which is the future. The approach they propose involves using chains that overcome the input length limitations. Chains were traditionally used to break up complex inputs into smaller chunks, process each chunk individually and then combine the outputs to process long documents. This approach is still valid, especially given the challenges of supervising models with size of up to 32K. Determining whether these models attend to all the inputs is difficult, so breaking up the input lengths remains valuable. The second challenge is overcoming complex tasks. For example, it can be overwhelming if you ask ChatGPT to write a blog post on how to run your application on Kubernetes and retrieve your code. It's better to break down complex tasks into smaller subtasks and define a workflow for the language model to follow to complete your request. Chains have greatly improved search capability. For instance, there is the example of multi-hop question answering. In this process, we formulate a query, retrieve information, potentially look back to retrieve more context, and then we use that information to answer the question. One way to improve this process is to use language models to create a filter for our search. Rerink documents with language models have also played a significant role in search. As language models have evolved, it has become clear that they can be better represented as graphs. For example, we now have a lang graph, and we can think about this as text transformation graphs. We have graphs of computation where edges pass along the transformation of text. We input and output text sent along the edge to the next node for further transformation. For instance, we can spin up three separated processes of writing and editing a story in parallel. Then we can sync these nodes into a published stories component in our LLM program. This can be used to produce newsletter based on the news of a specific week like what happened on Yahoo Finance last week. We can parallelize the process of writing and editing the story and then sync it into another part of the program. We must aggregate these stories and combine all the information to create a coherent narrative. Before you delve further into DSPy, I highly recommend checking out the LLM program galleries that both Lama Index and Langchain have created. While frameworks are great for building LLM chains, graphs, agents, and programs, they have limited flexibility. 
That's where the SPY program comes in as a complete LLM program language. In contrast to frameworks, the SPY offers more exciting possibilities for LLM programming without prompting. There are two main advantages to having a program language for LLM. First, it allows you to have structured input and output prompts to consistently express your ideas within your programs. Second, it will enable you to control how your LLM models interact with each other programmatically, and this unlocks the flexibility to customize the LLM program to suit your needs and imagination while using the LLM API. Okay, let's begin by discussing how to clean up your prompts and structure it input outputs. To achieve this, just by use a signature. This example, we have the generate answer that inherits a signature. Also, we write a doc string that describes the task prompt. In this particular context, the task involves providing concise answers to questions. Later in the video, we will discuss how the SPY can assist you in optimizing these prompts. You can give a general overview of the task and the SPY will take care of the rest. You don't need to tweak the language because even subtle changes can significantly impact the performance. The SPY will optimize your instruction, but we can discuss this later. There is a method for defining input and output fields that provide a consistent syntax for the prompts and the structured outputs of all components in LLM programs. This is one way to ensure consistency in your LLM programs. Another exciting feature is the ability to control how the LLM models interact with each other programmatically. Okay, let's talk about the controls in LLM programming. For example, use a specific syntax to create a for loop in your program. You can even access hops that are not in this example. You can interface these loops and write more complex code with if-else statements. Here is a quick example inputting a stock ticker. You can prompt the program to output financial details if it's about a specific company. I have a program that first processes my financial database and identifies whether they relate to some ticker. If they are, I can ask the program to research the company's performance and some reports. I can also use the program to do a web query and get more information about market trends and recent news. Then, the program will generate a query and send it to the API. After that, the API will respond with the required context. Then I can write potential investments in sites and send them via email. However, I would review it first before sending it to anyone. The point is that you can have a good control flow for the LLM programs by using the for loop, if statement, and local memory. The next big thing is the SPI assertions, which will be discussed in a separate paper. Alright, so by now, I hope you are convinced of the DSPy syntax and how it can offer you more control and flexibility over your LLM programs. So, DSPy is like PyTorch for the LLM program. PyTorch is a popular deep learning model training framework. This tweet explains a lot about PyTorch. Two main things make PyTorch stand out, its syntax for defining neural networks layer and its eager execution feature. PyTorch and TensorFlow both have different ways of implementing eager execution. To use PyTorch, you must first define a neural network and initialize the layers you will use. When defining a layer such as a convolution, you must specify the input and output determining the graph transformation. It's like matrix multiplication, where the dimensions of the matrix have to match. You need to define the layout of the neural network and ensure that the input and output layer layers are compatible with each other. After that, you define the forward pass, which determines how the network processes the input. We now have the syntax for defining components in LLM programs. You can initialize the program by defining its components. Next, you define how the forward pass will look. 
There were some excellent analogies for designing the SPI inspired by PyTorch. The first important point is that we should rely on more than one layer to perform all the work. We must add inductive bias and depth to improve the model's efficiency. For instance, in the convolutional PyTorch network, the convolution has an inductive bias of the weight sharing kernel as it slides across an image pixel matrix. Similarly, we can observe that signatures have this inductive bias of what the part of the program is supposed to do. Suppose a program has a specific context, question and query. In that case, it is an inductive bias for that particular program part. This component of the program is designed to perform a specific task. The idea of inductive bias is fascinating. Okay, let's discuss a big concept, the DSPy compiler. The best way to understand the concept behind this is to start testing it with the program you have in mind to optimize. Let's dive into the instruction tuning. The goal is to eliminate the need for manual prompt tuning, prompt engineering, and manual example writing. For example, when training a hangar agent, one might experiment with various phrasings of the instruction. It is important to note that how you phrase your prompt for hanging documents can affect the performance of different language models. For example, a prompt that works well with GPT-4 might not work well with Gemini Ultra or Lemma 2. Therefore, the optimal phrasing for your prompt will depend on the specific language model you are using. It's important to fine-tune your ending prompts to stay up to date with the latest language models. With the new language models emerging every month or so for at least the next year or year and a half, keeping your LLM programs currently is crucial. Using an automatic tuning framework can help you quickly and easily plug in a new language model and determine which prompt will generate the desired response. A fun thing happens sometimes when someone asks for something specific like a we pay you a million dollars to output JSON. These requests can be confusing and difficult to understand. However, DSPy aims to solve this problem by starting with a basic signature and then optimizing it to create the best possible shorthand for answering questions. This shorthand could be used for quickly answering fact-based questions or providing context for more complex queries. It is going to optimize a more detailed description of the test. The way it works is interesting. There are built-in programs in the DSPy compiler that can be used to end pre-existing prompts in the chains. However, there are some prompts on how to use LLMs to optimize LLMs. So we have this prompt for optimizing the instruction. So you add an instruction optimizer for large language models. I will give you a signature of fields, inputs, and outputs in English. Your task is to propose an instruction that will lead to a good language model to perform the task well. Don't be afraid to be creative. So, don't be afraid to be creative for the last part. That's what we are hoping to end with the SPI. After completing that, you can propose some instructions. This prompt takes multiple instructions and combines them into one. It uses sampling to create multiple outputs and then aggregates them to produce the final result. This is how we optimize the task's signature and description. Examples have played a crucial role in the development of deep learning. In the past, research papers often described datasets consisting of hundreds of thousands of examples, such as the squared question answer dataset. These examples were focused on human writing natural language language inference. They were used to identify entailment, contradiction, and other related phenomena. In the past, people used it to create massive human labeled datasets. Today, with the help of generative models, we can generate training data to make smaller, more precise models and use them as examples in prompts. This concept is known as few-shot learning and it was explained 
in the GPT-3 paper released in 2020. It was surprising that you achieved this task without any prior examples. The term zero shot refers to the situation where you only have the task description to work with and need to create a clear set of instructions without any examples to guide you. One shot indicates that you have one example to work with, while a few shots means you have a few examples. One of the most exciting parts of the DSPy framework is that you can create examples by bootstrapping. You can prompt GPT-4 and Gemini Ultra, for example, but you can also prompt Mistral 7B or Alliama 2, depending on when you want to fine-tune these models versus a few shots. When using bootstrapping, the question arises which examples should be included in the prompt. For example, we have 10 examples and are trying to translate from English to Portuguese. In that case, we may only want to include three of those examples in the input. Another use case for bootstrapping is when we want to train a model to understand a chain of thought rather than just input or to put pairs. In this case, we should include examples that show how a person arrived at a particular answer in addition to the answer itself. For example, suppose you are building a chatbot that answers FAQs. In that case, we should include the entire conversation leading up to the answer. Suppose you want to add a chain of thought to your answer. You can retrieve the relevant context from your documentation and use examples to explain your reasoning. You can use the SPI to help you bootstrap the rationale and have the LLM write it for you. This way you can have a clear and concise answer that includes all the necessary information. How do we know the quality of synthetic examples? This is a common question when using LLM to create synthetic examples, whether for prompts or for fine-tuning the model. The answer lies in metrics and DSPy. One way to get started is to use an exact match metric. For example, if you have a fact-based question, such as what is the temperature of empty space, and the answer is 2.7 degrees Kelvin, an exact match would be a good way to measure the quality of the synthetic example. For example, if you write out the answer instead of using the numerical value, an exact match would not recognize the answer as correct. Moving on to the quality of our synthetic examples, we use teleprompters to optimize the loop, exploring different instructions, writings, and examples in the prompt. This tutorial explores the teleprompter system, suggesting examples for language model components, creating new signatures, and analyzing metrics. We will start by looking at the code. The tutorial aims to provide the experience writing the SPI programs and understanding uh, syntax using off-the-shelf compilers. Hopefully, you will find it helpful for your LLM programs and gain a better understanding of the concepts discussed. So let's start with an example of a DSPy program. Retrieve augmented generation is a popular LLM chain where you retrieve and generate. Another program we will look at has a write the query part with two LLM programs. This will give us a quick sense of the syntax. Similar to PyTorch in the LLM program of RAG, we first initialize the components we will use. Then we define how these components interact with the input data and each other in the forward pass. When a user enters a question into our app, we pass this question to our retriever. The retriever brings relevant passages, which we then pass into the answer generator to generate an answer. In the SPI, the signature gives the LLM a sense of the task. It's a short read notation of question, context, and answer. You can also write out longer signatures for a prompt. This is similar to organizing prompts using uh, strict typing in libraries. When you need to parse the output of a program, you can use a longer hand notation. This notation allows you to write an initial prompt in the doc string. You can also define types of the different fields and give them a description of the input. 
However, you can also use a short rent notation. Anyway, you understand the program now. It's a rag program. You might feel overwhelmed. So let's discuss a more complex program that involves optimizing two LLM programs. In such programs, multiple components must be optimized separately to achieve impressive behavior as a whole system. Simplified Berlin is a multi-hop question answering system. The concept of multi-hop question answering involves breaking down complex questions into smaller sub-questions. For example, the data set presents the question. This question is too complex to be answered directly, so it must be broken down into smaller, more manageable parts. To approach a question using RAG, you must break it down into smaller parts. First, identify the subject of the question, such as the name of the castle, then ask specific questions related to that subject, such as the number of uh, stories in the castle. This technique of breaking down a question into smaller parts is one of the most powerful tools in RAG. Multi-hop question decomposition is an exciting concept that can take RAG to the next level. It connects syntax with local memory, making program building more effective. Again, first we need to initialize the components we will use. We start by writing a signature to generate a search query. The signature includes a short description of the task, writing a simple search query that can help answer a complex question. Then we briefly describe the context, which can contain relevant facts, questions, and queries. We assign our models to let them generate queries. We have a list of models that we can use for this purpose. To simplify things, we can write this self.generate underscore query equals the spy dot chain of thought generate search query. This will help us to generate the search query automatically. The interesting point to consider here is the possibility of having a distinct program for the initial search query from the second one, since we will generate queries in a loop. To achieve this, we could use a list. For example, we could use quadrant for our retrieval purpose. I mean, it must be quadrant because it's awesome and you have no choice. Next, we have to answer the question based on the information provided. In the forward pass, we have a loop that iterates through the number of hops. Let's assume we want to break down our question into only two questions, which means the maximum number of hops is two. We generate a new question during each iteration by taking the current context, what we have searched, and the question as input. First, we will retrieve the passages and then use a helper function. Note how you can incorporate these helper functions into the forward passes of your LLM programs and how you can use the syntax to write anything you can imagine with these LLM programs. Before I finish up, let's review the entire notebook to combine all the concepts. Firstly, you need your OpenAI key, which you can get in the API key section of your OpenAI account. After that, we import the SPI and connect to GPT 3.5 Turbo. We use Quadrant as a retrieval model to store the document vectors. So we configure the SPI by setting the language and Quadrant retrieval models. We will be using the Hotpot KA dataset to benchmark multi-hop question answering. This dataset consists of 20 training examples and 50 examples for validation with our metric. This is a significant difference from how we deep learning use it to be done. And we have the SPI which needs only 20 examples to optimize it. So let's take another simple question. We have a doc string that describes the task and provides answers to questions in short factoid answers. Additionally, we have an input field where we can give a description, but it is not required. We can use the name of the variable. We have the output field and its description. An interesting feature of the SPI is that you can inspect the intermediate output and we can do it like this. Here's an example of the uncompiled DSPy. 
what is the nationality of the chef and restaurant are featured in Restaurant Impossible. The product answer is American, I'm not familiar with it, but let's proceed. Let's return to the DSPI building blocks. If you want to add a chain of thought to your prompts, you can change dspy.product to dspy.chain of thought. DSPI will provide rationales for you to add an explanation to your prompt, which will make it better. Having an explanation can also help with debugging and improve the performance. Here is an example of how your thinking process works. Please note that this is not compiled, it's just a forward pass. The building model is helped by adding reasoning to the prompt. This intermediate reasoning has been produced for us. Let's break it down step by step. Remember that this is just a forward pass done by the language model. We haven't compiled this, but we noticed that adding a thinking step can make the switch from American to British. This is a valuable insight that can be quickly implemented. Here is an example of how to connect to one of the retrievers. We can retrieve data with a question and display the output type. Okay, now let's compile a RAG program. So we will start with generating a signature answer questions with short factoid answers. The input field, I mean the context, has a description, may contain relevant facts. We will get the question from the variable name and answer often between one and five words. We are creating our RAG program. To start, we need to initialize the necessary components, retrieve them and generate a response using a chain of thought. This response will then be passed into the DSPI chain of thought. The DSPI chain of thought will add the reasoning element to the prompt. During the inference, the model will have the ability to reason. However, this time we will compile it. In the forward pass, we fed the question and passages to the question answer model to obtain the answer. All right, so now we are discussing the teleprompter, the optimizer. First, we need to define our metric. We will use the exact match, which means that if the answer is British, it must be precisely British. We will also use the passage match, but let's focus on the exact match to keep things simple. The teleprompter will use the bootstrap method and a few short examples. This means it will add a few short examples to the prompt. Also, we have supervision on the retrieval, and that's how it will be optimized. So then you have compiled rag equals teleprompter dot compile rag and train set equals train set. Let's run. After optimization, the process stops. Once we have compiled our reg, we can run inference by passing in the input, similar to how you would do it in PyTorch. And we get this answer to our question. Let's try the trouble inspect history again, so we can debug what the model saw last. So in this prompt, we can see some examples of answering questions with short factoid answers. The reasoning behind this is what makes the DSPy valuable for RAG. However, suppose you are using an FIQ dataset and want to chat with your docs. In that case, you may not want to keep writing the same reasoning over and over again. If you want to examine the parameters, which are the examples, here is how you can do it. Similarly, if you want to evaluate it, you can pass the dataset through it and get the metrics. It runs the forward pass of your program and provides you with the same match and pass match for each example. I still need to run more examples, but the purpose of this video is to help you understand the concept. Hopefully this example introduced you to how to write the syntax. I hope you enjoyed the overview of the SPI. We covered the topics such as the program model, the compiler and the introduction example. We look at that basic question answering, adding a chain of thought reasoning, RAG and other related things. So. Let's continue the conversation in the comments. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I see you in the next one.